Hello, and welcome to another lecture in CI2230, Advanced Java Programming. Today we're going to talk about one of the most fundamental concepts to object-oriented programming, uh, particularly in terms of graphical user interfaces, and that is events. Prior to this term, when you've been working in uh, uh, programming, you've worked primarily with what we might call serial programming or command line programming where something is executed and then simply waits for someone to type in a response, hit return, and then the next set of code runs. Whereas in typical graphical user interfaces, uh, input is way more asynchronous. You have uh, a myriad of choices of things that you can do and then as you make those choices they drive uh, the movement of the program. In a formal sense what we call this <clears throat> is event driven programming. An event can be described as any input or signal that comes to the program or a specific object within that program that can be used to derive a specific action or response. For instance, if, um, if I move my mouse around on the screen as I'm doing now, every movement of the mouse triggers an electrical signal to the computer and the operating system handles that by moving the image of the arrow a certain number of pixels based on the amount of movement I do with the mouse. The electrical signals coming from the mouse as it's moved are uh, used to drive the movement of the mouse uh, arrow. That is event-driven programming. In particular, during the, the course of this class, between now and the end of the term, we will look at working with uh, mouse events, uh, particularly mouse clicks, um, various keyboard key presses. Um, you know, if you press different things on the keyboard, we can drive different events based on those. And we'll also work with um, the CPU clock. Time events um, are particularly important for uh, actions within programs that aren't driven by the user, uh, such as uh, animations. So these are all things we are going to look at um, during this term. So we're going to star start specifically today... Um, by working on a new example. We will be revisiting a little bit with the person-employee um, structure that we've been working with um, previously, but we're going to um, work with something a little bit different today uh, f uh, for the sake of mixing it up and to look at um, several new concepts which um, center around this concept of event-driven programming. So one of the things that we see typically at, um, as we work with JavaFX, what we'll get very um, familiar with is the idea that all of our JavaFX programs will inherit or uh, inherit from or extend the application class uh, in the application package. We'll also get very uh, used to the fact that everything, all the uh, action, if you will, of the um, application occurs inside the scene, a scene object. Um, and it'll all occur on a stage um, object that is passed in uh, by the virtual machine when it first runs the JavaFX application. 
And for most of our applications, we're going to do some sort of interface controls. So we'll um, generally need to import um, those, and we'll almost always have some sort of layout. Today we're going to continue to use the flow pane um, layout and we uh, we will use that primarily for um, uh, what we're working with today. And I'm going to go ahead and throw in one additional import now so I don't forget. Um, I'm going to import um, the classes for the event package because uh, as we just spoke about we are going to be dealing with um, events. So as we always do we begin by creating a public class. I'm going to call this one temperature conversion fx and it is going to extend application. I'm going to save the application now for the sake uh, of getting the extra formatting and um, autocompletes that I get by um, note from Notepad++ by it knowing that this is a Java application. That this is Java code. Terrific. So to begin with, I'm going to go with um, some things that uh, review what we did from last week. Review from one week to the next is always a valuable way to um, see the repetition and kind of get the concept that um, once we learn something, it applies um, to lots of examples and lots of ways of working in Java. So we're going to create a label. If you remember, the label is just a static set of text um, that appears on the interface and really doesn't uh, have any interaction. It simply helps us know what other uh, interface elements are used for. We're going to do the text field. We're going to use a generic um, no argument constructor just like we did last time. This time we're going to do some regular buttons. Last time we worked with radio buttons, but now we're just going to use some uh, buttons that will uh, carry text and uh, that we can press. And I'm going... Uh, like radio buttons, they uh, can be seen as self-labeling. This label doesn't go uh, next to our uh, button, but rather on top of the button. And each of these buttons is going to handle converting our temperature one way or the other. So those are our interface elements. I'm going to create a um, a flow pane. I'm just going to call it pane this time. New flow pane. That's where they're going to do our layout. And if you remember from last time, the flow pane is going to take our interface elements in a left to right, top to bottom uh, format. And I'm going to declare my scene globally but I'm not going to instantiate it until after um, I've put all of the interface elements on the on the layout that I'm adding to the scene. If you remember from last time, we are going to override or replace the version of 
the start method that comes with the uh, application class. with our own and when we replace that it's called an override and if you remember the annotation tells the compiler that I believe there is a method with this signature inside the application class that way if there is not because I made a mistake the compiler will warn me that what I've typed doesn't match anything that's in the application and since it's important for this to match for it to be the method that the uh, runtime environment calls um, I want to make sure I get it right just like last time I am going to set the pref column count this time I'm going to set it to seven. It doesn't need to be as long for a name as it, uh, I mean, as long for a temperature as it did for a name, like we did last time. Um, and I don't have to do any of the any presetting for anything else. No setting of default numbers or anything like that. So I can get straight to adding my interface elements to my layout. Now, if you remember from last time, oh, that should be get children. The pane, the um, the layout has a children container, or uh, we can think of it as a box that contains the interface element called children. When I call the get children method on that layout. This highlighted section here returns to me um, the container so that I can then call methods on that container such as the add all. Because the flow pane adds everything in a left to right top to bottom fashion, the, the um, order of the elements does matter. So um, I am just going to go ahead and whoops, C to F button. Um, add them in the order uh, I want the elements to appear, and then I can get working with the stage itself. I can set the title. Theron. Height. We do two slashes because that escapes the slash character um, so that it appears as a slash rather than thinking I'm doing slash capital C. That'll be my title. Now, um, I forgot to instantiate my scene. Let's do that real quick. In order to add it, I do need it to exist. So we will do new scene and that scene is going to take in the layout and I am going to set the size at 250 by 250 and again that is in pixels. Now I can go back to the primary stage and I can set the scene. That will be with my scene object. And then I can render the whole thing, as I like to call it, lifting the curtain on our play by doing show. At this point, we've essentially um, done a lot of the work that we did last time. So we can go out to our command prompt to compile and run our program. We can see that it's there and do Java C temperature.
conversion fx.java. As long as I didn't make any mistakes, um, and I did, I did not capitalize scene in my constructor. Right there. So now I can save. And let's recompile that. And so what it appears as though I've done is when I was going to fix my error, I accidentally moved some text there. Uh, inadvertently, now that looks correct. So I'm going to go ahead and let's uh, hope that the third time is the charm. Perfect. Now we can see if we have a work or a uh, an interface. Now at this point, I can type things in to my text box because that event handling or the uh, the ability to type in there is all handled inside the text field object, and I don't need to know how they do that. That's where encapsulation comes in. But right now, if I press these buttons. Nothing seems to happen. That's because we haven't um, we haven't built in any event handling into our buttons. So let's go ahead and get started on that. There are going to be a number of new concepts that we throw in here. Um, so uh, Bear with me as we go through this this process. Um, uh, this will give us a lot of power and things to move forward with in uh, our Java programming as a whole. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ma make private class whoops, button listener. And that is going to implement an event handler for an action event. This line of code in particular has a, a, a very large number of new ideas or new concepts that we haven't seen yet um, in our experience as Java programmers. The first thing we see is that, th is that this is a private class. We call this an inner class. We're used to making classes public because in other applications or other programs or other class definitions, we're going to create objects out of this class. Um, if it's a application or or a program with a main like like that we run, um, we use it. We don't specifically make objects out of it, but rather um, run it. But uh, it needs to be ac accessed outside of any object of this. Whereas with our list button listener, um, we're only going to make objects of the button listener type inside of a temperature conversion FX. One thing, one concept about event handling that's very common is event handlers tend to be very specific. They deal with ideas or concepts that are specific to this application. What happens when I press the F to C button or the C to F button isn't going to make sense in the context of some other application. So we tend to build our event handlers inside um, another class. 
by making it a private or inner class, we won't ever use it outside of here. In theory, we could have created this as a public class in a separate file and then created um, objects out of it in here, but typically um, we don't do it that way. Since we would never use that class anywhere but in here, we'll um, simply create it as an inner class. The next thing that you'll notice on this line of code that seems new is this implements keyword. Now we learned a couple weeks back about the extends keyword. Extends allows us to inherit from another class that has its own properties and methods. We get those properties and methods along with all of our own. With the implements um, keyword, what we're doing is we are um, creating a class that implements a, a special kind of template call, uh, called an interface. Just as an aside, in Java, we have something called reference types. By far, the most common of reference types is one we've been using for quite some time uh, as Java programmers, which is called a class. Another one that we're familiar with that we've used quite a bit up to this point, um, particularly in our intro classes, is an array. Um, we briefly introduced uh, another one called an annotation, which is a reference type. And um, in particular today, we're going to work with a new one called an interface. Now what's interesting about an interface is it is essentially a template for a class without any implementation. So uh, if I'm making um, an interface for um, for a event handler, I might do public interface event handler that I can then do something like this public void handle um, action event e and the 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 body of that method is blank we call this an abstract method Abstract methods are methods that don't have any code in them, no implementation. Now you might think, why is it that we would ever create such a thing? When we go back to what I was just talking about in our previous code, when we create our event handler here called button listener, we are working with something very specific to my temperature conversion application. This event handler um, is going to do things that I, as the programmer, have just thought of long after the um, idea of creating an event handler was built into the language. So what's going to happen is when the button is pressed, that button is going to call a method. But it needs to know what that method is before I've had an opportunity to write what it does. Another way of looking at that is the person 
who wrote the button class that we're using here needs to have a mechanism by which to call uh, a, an event handler when uh, an, uh, an event occurs. When it calls that event handler, um, it needs to know what to call, even though that won't have been written yet. So the, be the way that um, programming language designers have, have come to be able to have that concept of putting the cart before the horse and having it work is what the method has to, or what the class or the method has to look like is predefined. But what happens uh, can be done at, at programming time. Uh, and it can be done specifically by overriding the method. So if I go in here and do my at override public void handle action event e, what I'm doing is replacing the version that came with the interface, which is of course empty, um, with what with my implementation. Actually, we've seen this once before, but we didn't talk about it. I left it to this time so that we can do it um, together. Uh, 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 we can look at the concept together in two different places. So if I go back to my API documentation that you all know um, that I like to use, I'm going to open both the FX and the regular. And if we go to the uh, Java FX application application class, what you'll see is that the start method has this extra modifier on it that says that start is abstract. What that means is that within the application class, we have one method that was not implemented. Because again, the people who created the application class wanted to be able to give us all the stuff that it needed, but what happens when it launches or starts, they don't know because they're not implementing that. We're implementing that. Now the difference between an interface and um, an abstract class is an abstract class has one or more um, methods that are that are actually implemented. We have uh, several methods that are implemented. We have um, a constructor um, that that we can call. We only have one method that's not implemented. So we have to specifically call out which method is abstract and when we define um, the class itself we have to it had to be indicated that it was abstract. That way the compiler knows we can't create objects directly with the application class. We have to create um, our own class that extends it. Abstract classes must be inherited to be used. But that said, 
going down to the event, you see there's this these interfaces. These are the other reference types in here. And one of them you'll see is the event handler. And you'll notice with abst or with uh, interfaces, we have a very concise um, we have a very, very uh, concise description. The interface simply uh, has a single method. Now, it doesn't say that it's abstract, abstract because all methods in an interface are abstract. So it doesn't need to be called out. When it's created, public interface event handler it um, it's understood that every method will be abstract and there won't be any code in any of the methods. Um, if this concept is a little foggy right now, it's not clicking immediately. Hopefully as we progress through through the semester and we do this a number of times, uh, it'll become something you are more comfortable with. Um, what's most important for us at this time um, is to know that because it's abstract, we have to override the start method from our abstract class application. And because event handler is an interface, we have to override the public void handle event. Now there's one last thing on this line. Um, I said up front this line is kind of lots of new concepts all packed into one line of code. Um, but there's one last thing on here that will look unfamiliar to you. That is this idea uh, where we have less than action event greater than. When I go back to the API documentation, you'll see that there's what it says here is less than T uh, extends event. And in the method summary down below, what it says that handle takes in is T and the local name for T inside the um, inside the implementation is uh, is event. What this is is this is something called a generic. It's on our sort of free space here, a generic um, is a class or interface that allows several different data types to be used by the same class. This is a method to, uh, of saving programmers a lot of work. If, for instance, we were creating a class that worked with numbers, we might, um, we might wind up having to make a lot of methods that do the same thing with different data types. For instance, if I were going to write a method that was public um, int factorial that took in int base and uh, or that took in int base and then in here whoops, calculated the factorial of base I might also have to do public double factorial double base
and calculate the factorial of base. Now in theory, the code that would replace this comment would be identical in both places. I called the local variable the same thing and the operations would all be the same. I would be multiplying the base um, times the base minus 1 times the base minus 2 times the base minus 3 and so on and so forth. And um, But I'd have to create two separate methods for integers and doubles because they're not the same thing, but I would work with them in the same way. If I instead was able to define the class in such the way in such a way that I simply wanted it to be numeric then I can replace this with a holding value where if I did something like t um, is numeric then I can do t base and the person using making uh, objects out of my class or if this were static using it statically they would simply just need to define what t is here and as long as t was numeric they'd be fine. So when they implemented it, they could say int or double or float and then use the same down here. One of the places you may have seen the, a, a similar uh, type of syntax outside of programming is in word processing there's an idea of mail merge where we do something like um, Dear name, comma, um, you uh, have a grade of grade in class, class, where there would be a separate spreadsheet with column names of name grade and class that might say Brian Borgon, B plus, CIT 230, you know, Veronica, uh, Wooten, A, CIT 130, and so on and so forth. And through a process of merging, you produce a number of form letters, all with those things personalized. Um, the generics work the same way so that we can use methods that use the same code base for different data types um, uh, and, and wait to define that until programming time. Again, that may sound complex at this time, but don't worry. It is something that you will um, get comfortable with uh, as we move on, we will make event handlers um, of a couple of different um, types, and you'll see how that translates. The biggest thing you need to realize is that T stands for type, and all that we need to, to do is put something in here that uses event or that has event in its inheritance chain. So either event or something that. Um, in, uh, it, uh, extends event or extends something that extends event and so on. And you only have to replace it in the, in the um, implements line and in here. You're basically, you're going to put in what you want for T in both places and as long as T um, is event or extends event, you will be in good shape. So that's what I've done here. We're implementing event handler for an action 
event and a mouse click uh, is an action event. And then I replace T down there with action event. So now we're ready to actually um, do the, the, the work of the event handler. So I'm going to create three um, global variables within this inner class. One of them is going to be an input temperature. Then I'm going to see, whoops, with 0.0. .0. And one is going to be an output temperature that I'm also going to seed with um, 0, 0.0. And um, for those of you who, you know, wonder, well, why am I uh, initializing them? Whenever we put things inside of try or, and catch statements or if statements and the um, value for that variable gets set in something conditional like that, um, the compiler gets upset if there's, a, you know, if there's not a value in them and we go to display it somewhere because it, it's going to say, well, this may or may not have a value in it. So if we initialize it, we know we are in good shape. I am also going to make a private button pressed button equals new button. I will explain what I'm doing with this shortly. Um, this is one of those things that um, I'm going to do as a means or a method whoops, of showing you um, something different than you might see in the book. I meant to put those at the class level, um, as you might be able to tell from my language. So I am going to move those. So now let's see what happens when the event is, uh, is detected. When we have an event, this handle method will get called. Now you'll notice there are two different buttons. What you'll see if you look in your textbook um, is a, a, in, in an example similar to this, what they would do is they would create two separate inner classes, maybe button listener and button listener two, or they might even go to the lengths of calling it um, F to C button listener and, and C to F button listener. Um, but what I'd like to do instead, what occurs to me naturally uh, in my creative thought process, is that I want a single button listener that simply determines which button was pressed and does the appropriate conversion based on the request that comes in. So, what I have to do is be able to figure out where did the event come from? Because remember, this is an event handler. It is sitting and waiting. The handle method of that uh, object is sitting and waiting patiently for an action event to get passed to it. So all we know is that an event was passed to us. We don't know from where. So the first thing we need to do is determine where is that coming from. So I'm going to do e dot get source. An event handler um, is there's going to be an event passed in, and it's actually an event, um, an action event. We know it's an action event that's going to get passed in, and we're going to want to know who sent it. So what we might f find is 
some kind of method that tells us um, who sent me. And we see there's not really any methods of the action event itself. Um, uh, from experience, that makes sense to me because any event, whether it's an action event, um, a key press event, um, a, a generic event, we would expect all of them to have a source, and there may be good reason to be able to determine what that source is. So I would look in um, one of the sets of inherited methods, and luckily they're concise enough that I can quickly scan here and I see there's a get source method that comes from uh, the event object class. And the and the so the get source is merely just going to tell me who sent me. Now if I go back in here and I look at my uh, java.util.event object, I can go over here to my Java eight. Um, set Java util is not shouldn't be uncommon to us because it is where we get scanner from. Whoops, and I want to go to event object, and I can see that get source takes no input and returns an object. This is one of those places where polymorphism comes into play. Everything, every object of any class is also an object. Because events can be um, sent to an, to an event handler from all kinds of different things. They might come from a um, JavaFX button like they're going to here, but they might also come from uh, a swing um, text box where somebody was typing something and the, there was an on-change event that went. Um, it might come from a scanner, uh, an, a, a scanner, or an object representation of a scanner where someone's feeding in paper um, a paper document here, and that calls the handle method. So we want to keep that as generic as possible, so we just let the source be an object. Now we know, as smart programmers, that we the only events we're going to care about come from buttons. So everything else we want to ignore. So what I'm going to do is use a really cool keyword operator. There is a keyword in Java, instance of, that allows me to bridge that gap between um, polymorphism and inheritance, where I know that get source is going to return an object. The only objects I care about to handle the action event is but our button objects. So what I can do is using this binary operator on this side is an object of one type, on this side is an object uh, or a class which would be an object type and what we're seeing is is this object of this type and that will return a true or false answer so basically if we do that we now know that the source is a button and that we care about it so what I'm gonna do is now that I know it came from my from a button I'm going to use it to trigger the uh, pulling the temperature out of the text box. 
and putting it, storing it in the input temperature variable. So the input temperature will get what's in the in the in the field, and we call that temp field, as you'll see above. Oops, I meant to do dot get text. Now, if you remember last week, we used a set text to put something into a text field, or a, uh, 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 yeah, into a text field. Um, and in this case, we to retrieve something from uh, a text field, we would do get text. So that text is a string property of what goes inside the field, and we can set it and get it. However, I just said get text. That's going to give me a string. Input temperature is a double. How do I turn a string into a double? Well, one of the things that we can see in our API documentation is inside of java.lang, there are a set of classes, boolean, byte, character, double, float, integer, long, uh, short. These represent um, classes with a single property of the type uh, of a primitive type. These allow us to deal with primitive types as objects or as classes um, for various reasons. One of those being to be able to convert strings into them. So you'll notice down here in our methods that there is a method called parse double. Likewise, inside of byte, there's a parse byte. Inside of float, there's a parse float. Inside of integer, there's a parse integer. They're, they all have that. And that allows us to convert strings into primitive types. Because um, retrieving data from a text uh, field is extremely common. And um, obviously, we're going to want to turn those into the regular type. So since it's static, we're going to uh, pull it right from the class. And we are going to uh, send it the text in the box. But one of the things that um, you might think of immediately is, well, what if the person did not type in um, something that is a double? Well, let's look at that. What we'll see, just like we did with our java.comments that we've all worked with in homework one, that there's the possibility that Parse double can throw a number format exception if the string does not contain a parsable double. If I, if I type in Brian instead of 32, it doesn't have any way of converting Brian into a double. So it will throw an exception. Because of that, we need a try and catch block. Because that is going to matter a lot. So we are going to take in a number format exception, NFE. And for now, I'm going to leave a comment that says, tell the user that they um, type in something non-numeric. It's just a whole placeholder for me. Because I want to talk about how we're going to display that in a little bit. I don't want to get off track right now. I want to stay with uh, the concept. So. 
we know that an a, 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 a mouse click event was sent to us. At this point, we know it's from a button, because if it wasn't, we, would, we wouldn't even be doing anything. And we have converted that into a double, or an exception was thrown, and we have to try again. But at this point, all I know is that the source of E is a button, not which button. So now I need to find out which button was sent. So I've created a local button object. This is a button object that will never be rendered. I'm simply using it as an object to refer to the button that sent me um, the event that passed the event, that called this method. I'm simply going to um, make a reference to that same button. So I'm going to do e.getSource, and that will store a, essentially it's, co it's like copying the source button into here. But if you remember, e.getSource is an object. It is not <clears throat> a button. But again, we've already verified that if I'm on this line, it is a button. So I can cast it. This will not cause an error because by the time I've gotten here, I can guarantee it is a button, and I can cast it um, so that I can so that it will be a button called press button. Now I know um, where it came from. So now um, I can determine what uh, formula I want to do to convert input temperature in to output temperature. So what I will do is if pressed button dot get text dot equals F to C, meaning it's the F to C button. I'm going to do one operation, and since there are only two buttons, um, I can put the other operation in an else. And the text, F to C or C to F, um, I, you know, I'm reading from the button, and remember, at like, as we talked about with the nested dot operators, pressed button is a button object. When I do get text, I'm now dealing with a string. All strings have an equals method where I can compare the text uh, or the value of this string to this string, and if they're the same, which they will be if I pressed F to C, then um, we can convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Now, one of the things um, I've done these kinds of uh, examples a lot, um, so I've gotten to the point now where I I've memorized the um, calculations from Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit, um, but they're actually relatively easy to memorize because we know that um, water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit and 0 Celsius. So if I'm going um, from Celsius, I mean from Fahrenheit to Celsius, the first thing I need to do is take my input temperature and subtract 32. That way, that's the first operation I need to do. 
Now the factors are 5 and 9 for dealing with Celsius and Fahrenheit. When I go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, my number is going to get smaller. 212 is boiling for Fahrenheit. Uh, 100 is boiling for Celsius. So I know it's smaller. So if the factor is 5 and 9, um, to get smaller, I want 5 on the top and 9 on the bottom. So... Um, and, and I knew that I needed to subtract the 32 first because, again, if I had 32, I subtract 32, that's 0. 0 times 5 ninths is still 0. That'll work. Similarly, if I'm going the other direction, I know that um, I'm going to wind up adding 32 but first, I want to modify the number. Uh, I want to use the factoring, the 5 and 9, to modify the number before I add the 32, because again, if I multiply and divide 0 by anything, it'll remain 0, so that then when I'm done modifying and add 32, I'll get 32. So I'm going to do input temperature. I'm going to multiply by 9, because to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, we want it to get bigger. I'm going to put the parentheses there. I don't necessarily have to, but um, it just feels more natural to me. So then I'm going to divide by 5. And then add my 32. So that will do that. Now we're down to um, one last thing, and that is showing the answer. Up to this point, we've always done something like this. System.out.println um, output temperature. This is a graphical interface. We don't want to send our data to the console. So where do we send it? One option is to put it back in um, the input uh, the input field, the temp field, the, the, the text box we pulled the other answer out of. So we could do temp field dot set text output temperature. For now, let's see what that does. For now, I'm going to still leave the catch no good. Um, I'm going to simply uh, do it correctly because um, we're not going to leave it this way. So we've done a lot of typing. Let's see if we've made any mistakes. And um, I forgot to convert my output temperature back to a string. Um, so what I want to do is do double dot to string output temperature. And if we look at our uh, double class, we'll see that there is indeed, shoot, let's go up to the, um, constructor method summary. Let's just go up to the method summary instead of trying to find it the other way. You'll see that there's a two string method. And this is super duper 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 common writing a two-string into any class is something that um, is almost ubiquitous. Um, the object class, the uh, java.lang.object, has a two-string, but that two-string um, returns something that's not very useful, something uh, real hokey like um, 
double at three F F seven B four where it says the type of object it is and the RAM address of that object. This is, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, useless for most things. So we typically create our own two-string method, as they've done here, um, to make that better. Whoops. I want to go back to my other tab. And we need to do the same here. Oops. Double dot to string output temperature. We'll save that. We will compile and it will work. I want to warn you real quick. This is not going oops, to work as expected because there's something I still need to do. So, I've created my event handler. So let's put in our 32, and let's change Fahrenheit to Celsius. Hmm. Nothing appears to be happening. Why is that? I've created a class, right? this private or inner class that has a great method that accepts actions, uh, action events into its handle method. But we never created any objects out of this inner class. So it's never getting called. What we have to do is what I call wire my buttons to receive or to, to call the handle uh, method. So the F, um, the F to C button needs to get um, an event handler. And what we do is we do a set on action method and create a new button listener. What this does is it creates an object, now that object has no name because we don't care, that is um, the handler whenever there is an action event uh, in the button. Essentially, somewhere in the implementation of, of the button class that we don't know, it's encapsulation, we don't know how they did it, it is trained to call the handle method of whatever is passed in here. And the same needs to be for the other button. And because I used a single listener, I can um, make uh, an instance of the same uh, class. So now we have an object of type button listener that um, the F to C button and C to Oops, F to C button and C to F button um, are uh, new to call handle. That's where the, the power of the interface came in. The person who wrote the code for button knew that the set on action would take in some implementation of an event handler for action events. And that it would ha and that it would then call the handle method, but it knew to call the handle method before I wrote it. That's why we need the interface, because otherwise we wouldn't we wouldn't have pre agreed on what to call that method. And if I don't know what to use, 
um, and he doesn't know what I'm going to use, then there's a disconnect. So that's the huge power of the interface. We've made an agreement before we even knew we made an agreement. Now it's wired. Both buttons are wired. So let's recompile. Oops. And let's rerun. 32, F to C. It works. But typically, um, that's not the greatest way to show the answer, depending on your own usage. You may, you may feel that's good, uh, particularly if you're using a very calculator-style interface. But it's real crappy uh, for this catch. It would be really hokey for the, um, hey, you need to put in a, a number error to show up in that box. So what we uh, what we want to do is some kind of pop-up. Now in Java FX there's no pre-created pop-up. That doesn't exist by you know by default in Java FX. We'd have to write that. And that's going to be the subject matter of our next lesson. But for today, um, what we're going to do, instead of taking the amount of time that would take to build our own pop-up, is we're going to borrow one. There is no golden rule that says, I can't mix swing interface elements with Java FX uh, objects. We're already um, mixing plain Java 8 stuff like our double class with stuff out of Java FX. There's no no reason that we can't use things out of swing as well. That's the beauty of object-oriented programming. I just need to import the right package and I can use classes from there interchangeably. So for the short term, we're just going to use the J option pane, which is a very powerful class that has a bunch of static methods for doing different kinds of pop-ups. So what I can do is I can do J option pane dot show message dialog. Whoops. Null output temperature. Now the null is indicating the parent. Um, object we don't need to set that parent object so in this case um, we're simply going to leave it as null and I could do the same down here and likewise I can do now the same down here but instead of output temperature, I can put a little message in there, something to the effect of, please enter in a numeric value for the temperature. Um, that'll, that'll pop up a little message for that. Now I want to do one extra thing to make this a little bit cooler and extend um, on something we would have learned uh, somewhere in our intro to Java. I am going to throw in, I'm going to concatenate on the back of the output temperature, slash u, 
zero zero B zero C and slash U zero zero B zero F. Now, if it doesn't seem, if you look at that immediately and you're like, I don't even know what Brian's doing, remember, the slash indicates some kind of escape character, or what we call an escape, sequence. When we see things like uh, numbers mixed with letters A through F, that is a big indicator that we are dealing with hexadecimal. Specifically, we're dealing with a hexadecimal code 00B0. But what does that mean? When we do slash U, what we're saying is we want to display a Unicode character. Now, for those not uh, specifically uh, familiar with Unicode, it's an extension of ASCII um, that includes uh, a more diverse worldwide set of characters than we might see um, in just ASCII, which was very uh, Eurocentric. Um, and what this is in specific, 00B0, is a degree symbol. How do I know that? Uh, Google is uh, an amazing tool. And if I go into Google and do Unicode degree symbol, what it's going to tell me is that a degree symbol is Unicode 00B0. So, seeing that, now what I've done is I basically said, give me a degree symbol followed by the letter F, give me a degree symbol followed by the letter C, and that is going to make it a little bit classier. We'll see zero degrees Celsius or, you know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and it'll look just a little bit better um, in the interface. So let's save it. Let's compile again. And now let's run it. And we can do 32. That shows that it's 0 degrees Celsius. I can do 0. That's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So far, so good. I can go to 12, that's 100 degrees Celsius. I can do 100, that gives me 212. Uh, we're in good shape. I want to do one last example. Um, negative 40 is a very special uh, temperature that you may or may not have heard before. Um, What's really cool about negative 40, it is the only temperature at which Fahrenheit and Celsius are equal. Negative 40 Celsius is negative 40 Fahrenheit. Negative 40 Fahrenheit is negative 40 Celsius. It's a little piece of trivia you can take with you. You ever go on Jeopardy and they ask you, um, you kind of have that. Um, so all the, you know, several of the commonly used temperatures that we know the value to all came out correct. So uh, my uh, old man memory worked and my formulas were correct. And I have a fully working um, graphical user interface. So um, this isn't uh, a ton of, of you know of addition everything up here to line 29 except wiring my event handler is all stuff we've seen before the new stuff is in here um uh I, i'll be uploading the example shortly and you'll be able to 
go through it with comments um, and review it for your own um, edification so that you can get used to um, building your own event handlers. And in homework two, you will um, indeed be building um, an, uh, an interface that uses uh, a button to um, to do to to handle um, uh, you know to, with an event handler wired to it. Um, so again, there were a lot of uh, new concepts today. We had our inner classes. We had we talked about interfaces, abstract methods. We talked about the generics framework. Um, we did a little bit, uh, worked a little bit outside the box by creating a holder reference variable so we could find out what button was pressed. Um, we looked at our instance of operator. Uh, so we've seen a lot, but um, again, these things, you'll get ch a chance to practice with them. And there, you'll you'll uh, also get opportunities to see them uh, again and again. So look uh, shortly for ex the example to be posted, and um, for homework two to um, be posted as well. Hope you've enjoyed today's lecture. Take care.